Everybody, thanks for being with us online. Hey, if you're on YouTube, feel free to subscribe below. Hit the like button. Feel free just to share out the stream to family and friends. Invite others to be with us as we worship Jesus. Let's just take a moment and pray. Lord, we just ask in Jesus' name that Holy Spirit, you'd come and presence yourself with each one who's with us online. God, we pray that you just make us more effective disciples in your hand. Help us to be obedient. Shape our lives to look more like our Savior. And we just pray for fresh encounter, God, with you. Thank you for your grace over our lives, Lord. Yeah, we just pray all this for Jesus' sake, in your name. Amen.
sang it in the early service. It was on, on my heart actually all week. It's called Your Mercy. Just reminded how much we need the mercy of the Lord and how freely He gave it to us. And um, I'm sure many of us know this song, but just sing it out with me today. And just think of, think of what we're singing. Think about these words today.
Hey everybody, just a couple announcements to keep you up to date. If this is your first time at Regina Apostolic Church, a special warm welcome to you. Hey, if you're with us online, check out www.reginaapp.com. Click the I'm new button for ways just to get connected into the life of RIC. If you're with us in person, hey, grab the connect card out of the chair in front of you, fill that out with your information and drop that off at the reception desk. We'd love to give you a gift. Thanks again for being with us. Friends, if you're interested in sewing into the mission of Regina Apostolic Church, there's multiple ways you can give. Check out www.reginaapp.com give for all the electronic methods. There's also an offering slot at the reception desk. Thank you for sewing into all that God is doing here and, and, and allowing us to create more resources like this. We are truly grateful. Friends, hey, for those who don't know, we have a YouTube channel on Sundays at 11 a.m. We have our online weekend worship experience. Hey, can I encourage you, if you haven't had a chance just to subscribe to the channel, we have lots of folks who watch from around the nation of Canada as well as different parts of the world. We're just trying to grow that channel just to help more people encounter Jesus. So we'd be grateful if you could subscribe and just take take a chance just to even um, connect with us online as well. Again, on Sundays at 11 a.m. on YouTube. 
Friends, in our last announcement, hey, we're in prayer for Kettleston Gospel Camp. This week coming up is Second Family Camp. We have Danny DeLong who will be with us as well as Dale Anderson from Calgary Full Gospel. Just love those two guys. They're going to be speaking. Hey, can you be in prayer for, for Family Camp? Just that the Holy Spirit would capture hearts. There'd be a fresh outpouring and that many hearts would just be turned to Jesus and refreshed in his name. Okay, guys, I hope this finds you well. You have a wonderful week. Hello, and thank you so much for being with us here today. I trust that you're having a good summer, enjoying the beautiful weather that we've been experiencing here in Saskatchewan. Hopefully you found some time to relax, maybe to a beautiful Saskatchewan lake or two. If you haven't had a chance to make it to Kettleston Camp yet, we have another family camp starting on July the 31st. You can go out for a day or an evening service or take in the whole week. We are so blessed to have access to such a beautiful spot on Last Mountain Lake. Pastor Matt and I, along with Pastor Chris Westby, who was on staff here at this church before moving to the West Coast, about eight years ago, we had the opportunity to be out there earlier this month during the first family camp. Pastor Chris was one of the camp speakers for the week. You know, we were fortunate enough, we had a 12-year-old young man teaching us some tips and tricks on the lake to improve our wake surfing technique. We couldn't quite keep up with his talents, but he was generous to help us out and answer all of our questions. You know, honestly, the most beneficial part was just watching him surf behind the boat. If I had to do it all over again, we really should have let him go first so we could just watch and take notes. But we took some lessons to improve our form anyway. You know, I started preaching a series earlier in July about the high value we have as a church for the presence of God. Kettleston has consistently been one of those places where God presences himself with his people, responds to our hunger, and moves in power. I've had many profound encounters with the Lord on that piece of real estate. I can think of specific moments there when God spoke to me and impacted the direction of my life. My mom was actually reminding me recently that I was only a few weeks old when they took me out to Kettleston for the very first time. And in fact, my wife and I, Chantel, we were even baptized there together before we got married. I promise, it's worth the investment to go to Kettleston. When I last preached, I left off drawing a distinction between the omnipresence of God and his manifest presence. God, of course, is everywhere, all the time. There's no place we can go on the planet to escape his presence. And we don't need to beg him to spend time with us. Even when we wanted nothing to do with God, when we were wallowing in the pig pen of our sin, like the prodigal son, God was still right there, lovingly drawing us back to our Father in heaven through the repentance of our sin and acceptance of Jesus as Lord. The Bible says that the prodigal son came to himself and he returned to his father. That's a work of the presence of God, snapping us back into our senses. God will never abandon us, even if we try to abandon him. We spoke about Moses being drawn towards the presence of God in the burning bush as he tended his father-in-law's sheep in the middle of a desert. Moses went on to meet with God face to face for extended periods of time, including a 40-day stretch in God's presence where he made the bold request of God to show me your glorious presence. And God agreed. There is a difference between simply being in God's presence, which we are every second of our lives, and experiencing his glorious presence. Moses was glowing as he descended from that glorious presence experience on the mountaintop. He was radiating the presence of God. Moses moved from one who had been attracted to the glow of God's presence at the burning bush to being the burning one who was glowing with God's presence. It set a standard, the pinnacle of what would be experienced by an old covenant believer in God's presence. But for us, the Apostle Paul describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that now in the new covenant, established by the blood of Jesus, we have access to a realm of God's glory and presence that makes what Moses experienced seem like no glory at all. Beginning in verse 10, it says, In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way, the new covenant. Then in verse 13, we're not like Moses, 
who put a veil over his face so that the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. And finally, in verse 18, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. You know, the idea that we can experience God's glorious presence to such a level that it makes the experience of Moses seem like no glory at all sounds almost too good to be true. It's almost unimaginable. It might even sound a bit arrogant. You might think to yourself, like, really? Little old me? I can experience something that Moses couldn't? But the reality is, If it sounds arrogant to us, it's probably an indication that we aren't adequately valuing the power of the death and resurrection of Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. As we consider all the mighty men and women of God in the Old Covenant, Jesus said, there is none greater than John the Baptist. You think about that. Moses, Elijah, Elisha, all of them were beneath John the Baptist on that greatness chart, if you will, according to Jesus. But he says, the least of us living now who have accepted Jesus as Lord in the new covenant are greater than John, who although had a very prominent role in the gospels, John was still very much an old covenant prophet. Jesus said it in Matthew eleven eleven. I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. So it's not arrogance. It's rightly understanding what we have access to thanks to Jesus, including the ability to partner with God in our prayers for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not humility to think less of ourselves than God thinks of us. I can't afford to entertain a view of myself that is different from how God views me. It would undermine the partnership he has planned to see his purposes accomplished through me and through you. Jesus paid too high a price at Calvary for us to live as though an old covenant example will be the high point for our lives. Because of Jesus, we have access to a life in God that old covenant believers only dreamed about. Where Moses had an experience in the glorious presence of God that resulted in the glow of God radiating radiating from his face, but already fading the very next moment, we have access to the Acts 2, Day of Pentecost experience, to have the Holy Spirit resting upon us as a tongue of fire descended on each believer that day. Instead of looking for a burning bush in a desert, we become the burning ones with the Spirit of the Lord God upon us and radiating from us. Today, as we consider what it's meant to look like in day-to-day practice to have the Spirit of the Lord God upon us or the presence of God upon us, Jesus is our model. He is the perfect prototype. He set the preeminent pattern to follow. We know, of course, John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan. The people would repent of their sin, and then John would baptize them. It was a baptism of repentance. And he prophesied of Jesus. John said to the people, I baptize you in water, but there's one coming who is greater, who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then, according to that prophecy, Jesus came down to the river and asked John to baptize him. We know that Jesus didn't need to be baptized. He had nothing to repent of. And in fact, John actually tried to talk Jesus out of it and suggested that Jesus baptize him. We pick up that story in Matthew 3 and verse 15. But Jesus said, back to John, it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. You know, in this moment, Jesus was already 30 years old. But he hadn't done anything that would have indicated to the people around him that he was anything other than the carpenter's son. 
Clearly, the father knew how Jesus had been behaving and knew the position of his heart. The voice that had come from the burning bush was now booming the approval for Jesus for everyone to hear by the Jordan River. Jesus was bringing the Father great joy. Despite doing no mighty works yet and living in relative obscurity, the Father was exceedingly pleased with Jesus. It shows us our value isn't measured by the perception of the people around us. Our value is set by our Father in heaven. And we see that obedience to the will of the Father is a key driver in that. This moment of baptism for Jesus is also signaling a spiritual shift. Jesus obviously had a well-established connection with the presence of his Father before this moment. It was noted when he was 12 years old, after he was found reasoning with the teachers in the temple, that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. To grow in favor with God, it speaks to connection and presence and obedience. That would last from that moment where he was 12 years old. It would last another 18 years until this moment of his baptism as something shifts. As he is raised from the water, the spirit descended upon him like a dove and settled on him. Or another translation says the spirit remained on him. It was a moment of empowerment. The spirit of God anointed Jesus for his ministry. The dove, we know, it symbolizes peace and gentleness, innocence and meekness. Attributes that speak to the qualifications of Jesus to ultimately be the sacrifice for our sin. This experience is his commissioning into his messianic work. The presence of the Spirit of God had moved from being with him and in him to being upon him. Have you ever wondered, you know, I thought about it as I was processing through this sermon. Have you ever wondered, why didn't God arrange for Jesus just to die as the sacrifice for sin immediately following this moment? You know, I think he was more than qualified to be the sacrifice by this point. He had put in three solid, sinless decades. And as we're about to see, God drives Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit upon him and then was driven into the wilderness. Although it's not documented, it stands to reason that Jesus had been tempted to sin like every human being is in those first 30 years of his life, but he was sinless. Almost as though to confirm his qualifications, he was tempted in the wilderness for the next 40 days in the same way the first Adam was tempted. Now Jesus, as the last Adam, resists every temptation to sin. When you think about the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, there were really, you know, four characters involved. God, Adam, Eve, and Satan. Again, we could have four people present in this moment as well, in this sequence. God the Father, Jesus, still here in the form of the Son of Man, Satan, and we could throw in John the Baptist for good measure. If four people was enough in the fall of man, wouldn't four have been enough for a redemption moment? Why didn't God just arrange for Jesus to be sacrificed right then and there? Hadn't he already cleaned up the mess that Adam had created? You know, I think he, he had. He could have immediately died and rose again three days later. John the Baptist and his followers could have been the witnesses to go and proclaim the good news. If it was only about making a way for us to have eternal life in heaven, then this could have been the end of Jesus' story on the earth. But the value for being in God's presence is not just a promise to be fulfilled one day in heaven. Certainly that's the ultimate promised land for us as believers, the perfect destination. But there is a reason why this wasn't the end of the road for Jesus. In the same way that once we become Christians, that it's not the end of the road for us either. God just doesn't kind of take us to heaven once we become Christians. Because it's not all about heaven. Part of God's gracious gift to us includes experiencing his blessing on this planet that he created for us to experience his empowering presence on the earth. Jesus, he exits the wilderness of temptation, successfully resisting all that Satan had thrown at him. 
but rather than being the sacrifice for sin, as though it was the end in that moment, he instead started his ministry that would last another three and a half years until the crucifixion. The Spirit of the Lord coming upon Jesus was the launch point for his ministry on earth. The presence of God isn't simply meant to be something that we behold in a passive way, but his presence is empowering as the fuel to produce the transformation this world requires. Which begs the question, specifically, what then should it look like? What does it mean to be empowered? How should the transformation appear? How will I know, how will you know, if we are living up to the standards set by Jesus with the presence of the Spirit upon us? You know, I really believe, this is just Jim's personal opinion on this, I believe too often in Pentecostal circles, we have this ideal of what the presence of God in our midst will look like. And typically, those expectations steer towards goals like speaking in tongues or powerful worship services or manifestations of the Spirit, like people falling at an altar. Which, by the way, I love all of those things. I love when God is authentically moving, that his presence is at work in our midst in that way. You know, I told you the story the last time I preached about being in a service where we could see the manifest presence of God that appeared like gold dust in the air. Listen, it was a lot of fun, and if I had the choice between gold dust or no gold dust in a service, I'd choose the gold dust every time. Maybe that, when you hear that, that seems a bit too extreme for you. You'd be more comfortable that instead of gold dust, it was a dove descending upon us, like feathers floating in the air and actual birds coming down. I mean, that's clearly what we just read happened to Jesus, so it would certainly be a biblical model. But all of those things, even the dove on Jesus, are merely symbols or signs that point to a greater reality, the reality of the presence of God himself that can rest upon us. We don't worship the sign, we worship the one the sign points to. Jesus goes from that experience with the presence of God upon him to demonstrate how our lives should look after the Spirit of the Lord comes to rest upon us as well. After his baptism and his temptation in the wilderness, his ministry begins, and he gives what could be referred to as his inaugural address in the temple in Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 16. It says, And he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home. He went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scripture. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. If we're wondering what a revelation of God's glorious presence will look like and how our lives should appear with the spirit upon us, Verse 18 should inform our expectations. Bringing good news to the poor, including those who are poor in spirit. Captives released, ministering physical healing, and the oppressed being freed. We are unable to accomplish those things by our own brute force and determination. But with his presence upon us, we are empowered to accomplish those impossible tasks. You know, even as we consider speaking in tongues like they did in Acts chapter 2, which we believe as a church is the initial evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit or having the Spirit of God come upon us, we need to see it as a sign that points to the Spirit of God himself upon us, empowering us to accomplish verse 18 type things. It's not the end of our journey any more than it was the end of the journey of Jesus when he had the dove on his shoulder. The dove wasn't the end point, and neither is tongues. Tongues to me are like going to the gas station to fill up my car with premium fuel to make the 300 horsepower German engine roar. The evidence that it has been filled is the gas gauge on the dash, But I don't sit there staring at the evidence, satisfied with the knowledge that I have a full tank. 
The point of the fuel is to empower the car to accomplish the purpose for which it was created. The effect of the Spirit being upon me is to be a burning one with the fire of God upon me. And maybe you've heard the old joke about the presence of God coming upon us. It's like a good pair of shoes. They're created for walking and they throw in the tongues for free. We are empowered by his presence. The Spirit is in me for me. When I accepted Jesus as my Savior, the Holy Spirit was set on my heart as a seal of my salvation. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 13, says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. We are signed, sealed, and will one day be delivered into heaven. I don't have to be eternally insecure. My identity as a son and my guarantee of heaven is sealed. The presence of the Holy Spirit is in me for me. The presence of the Holy Spirit upon me, though, is for those around me, for the world around us, to set captives free, to restore sight to the blind, and liberate the oppressed. There's a reason why we're all still here on this planet, why we haven't been taken to heaven yet. We're meant to radiate the light of Christ into this dark world. The Holy Spirit is in every believer then, but he does not rest on every believer. It is a subsequent experience after salvation, like happened on the day of Pentecost, where they were empowered by the presence of God to minister as Jesus had ministered after his empowerment, after his baptism. You know, we know Acts 2, of course, but there's another example that I think is instructive for us today. We see it in Acts 19 with the Apostle Paul. Beginning in verse 1, it says, And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. So these are believers. They're disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. We are designed to have the presence of the Holy Spirit sealed within us as our operating system and our guarantee of our eternal life with Jesus. And while heaven is our eternal destination, our mission is to bring the righteousness, peace, and joy of the kingdom of heaven to impact the people of the earth through the presence of God upon us. As we behold him, we are transformed into his image, including the image of his ministry, which is described so succinctly for us in Acts 10.38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. You know, as we close today, I want to pray for an outpouring of the presence of God upon you and upon myself today. I can't make you want it. I can't force that upon you. But if you ask for the Spirit to come upon you, He will. He responds just like He did, as I mentioned at Kettleston. As as we come hungry, He responds to our hunger. You can be sure that if you ask for the Spirit you're going to receive the Spirit. You know, if you've ever felt powerless or purposeless, purposeless, we can agree together for the Spirit of God to descend upon you today to fill you with His power and to give you His purpose. Wherever you are today, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit upon you, let's just pray together. Father God, we love you. Jesus, we're so thankful that you died on the cross for our sins. And Holy Spirit, we honor your presence with us that will never leave us 
or forsake us. Even when we're unaware of your presence, you're still right here with us. I just pray that you would descend upon us today, Holy Spirit. Empower us for the good works that you have planned for us, that we would be bold witnesses for you to declare the truth of Jesus and steward your power to minister to all who are oppressed. I just thank you, God, that we're, we're living in a day that our old covenant forefathers dreamed about and prayed about. We don't take it for granted, and we don't want to live beneath the high calling, Jesus, that you have for us. I just pray that from the very youngest child that would make this request to the very oldest, that there is not a point in time in life where we've missed it, that there is something in this season of our lives, regardless of what our birth certificate says, that there is no junior Holy Spirit for the kids, and there's not sort of a retirement version of the Holy Spirit either on the other end, that you have a full measure of your spirit and power to descend upon each of us today. Come, Holy Spirit, just come and rest upon us. You know, even as you pray today, to just ask in your own words from your heart, Lord, give me a picture. Help me to understand. I believe, even if you're in that spot, like the verse says, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. If it seems overwhelming, Lord, I just pray in the gentleness of your spirit that you would just come and reveal yourself in mighty power to each one that would be hungry today. I just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to thank you again for being with us today. If we as a church can support you in any way, including what we've spoken about today, even if there's some question about the Spirit, or if you want someone even to pray with you into those things, we would love to support you on your journey with God in whatever way we can. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us at the church, or we'd love to see you face-to-face in an in-person service and pray with you face-to-face at the altar or in the foyer or anywhere else around the building. So I just pray just that you would be blessed and uh, that you would just know his presence as you go this week. God bless. We have confidence.